Good afternoon and welcome to a workshop on creating an optimistic culture at work. Our speaker, which will be presenting for the next seven to five minutes, is none other than Dr. Greg Steinberg. An hour and 15. An hour and 15. <laughs> 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 I'll talk fast. <laughs> Dr. Greg is a professor of human performance at Austin P. Um, State University near Nashville, Tennessee. And our chair is Let's Go P. We haven't heard. Okay. Let's Go P. I'm saying that this is the lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and Golf Digest ranked him as number one in the world's greatest sports psychologist. Dr. Steinberg has worked with many PGA and LGPA players. He has also been the mental coach for the University of Alabama football team and the Vanderbilt baseball and men's tennis team and the Vanderbilt women's lacrosse team as well as many other organizations. Dr. Steinberg is the author of three mental toughness books including the Washington Post bestseller, Full Throttle, which illustrates performance psychology principles and applied to business. Then there's Flying Lessons, which illustrates two of the build mentality and emotional toughness in children and mental rules for golf, which is a golf psychology book. His work has appeared in New York Times, US Today, and the Wall Street Journal. He has also appeared in shows including Dancing with the Stars. But to discuss, I didn't dance, if you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> to discuss mental toughness and was a sports psychology expert for Fox News during the 2008 Summer Olympics. Dr. Greg has also given a TED Talk called Fall Up, which explains how to become resilient. And he lives in Nashville, Tennessee with his wife, Tommy, their son, Miles, and their Italian Greyhound, Bodhi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Greg Steenberg. Well, when Tennessee HR asked me to speak at the conference, I jumped at the chance because I love to talk. Just ask my wife. But I also love to share my knowledge. So it's definitely a privilege and an honor to speak with you this afternoon. And one thing that I want to share with you about myself is I love history. So I want to tell you a history story that you probably heard uh, a little bit of. And let me take you back 140 years to this great race, about 1880s. And it was a race to develop a commercially usable light bulb. Now, Back then, the light bulb was already invented, but it only lasted like five seconds, 10 seconds, and it wasn't commercially usable. And the person that could make a commercially usable light bulb would be richer than rich. So England had a team with the greatest scientists and all the money. France had a team with the greatest scientists and all the money. And there was also this one guy in Red Bank, New Jersey. Do you know his name? Do you know his name? Red Bank, New Jersey? And of course you know who it is. It's Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison had a great team. He had this amazing warehouse with all these chemicals, bamboo and charcoal, and they're just on the verge of developing a commercial, commercially usable light bulb, and boom, a fire was taking out his whole warehouse. It was burning down his warehouse. Now to me, if my life's work was going down in flames, I'd probably cry, right? And like you, I, it would be just horrific. But as history is written, Thomas Edison is standing next to his young son, Thomas Jr. And he tells his son, go get your mother. She's never gonna see a fire this great. <laughs> True story. And Thomas Edison is one of the most optimistic people in history. But it's not because of that, because most people get optimism incorrect. We're told optimism is one thing, but it's really something else. So let me tell you, optimism is not this rosy outlook. As you can see with this turtle, he's flying because he's upside down. 
That's not what optimism is. Optimism is not an unbridled confidence. I know we're told that, but it's not. And optimism is not this complete positive self-talk. Even though all those things are great and they're real important, that is not what optimism is. Today, I'm going to tell you what the science is behind optimism. But most importantly, I'm going to show you how to apply that science to your life so that you can make your home life more optimistic and you can make your work life more optimistic so that, of course, you'll be happier and more successful. So what optimism is and what the science says that optimism is, is how we explain failure. So in a nutshell, and I'm going to go into a little more detail in a moment, but in a nutshell, when you fail, you want to know why. And you're going to explain the outcome. Now we call that attribution. So that's why people who are optimistic have a different attrib uh, attributional style than people who are pessimistic. And because of that and how we explain this failure or this event or this event that didn't go the way we wanted, it makes us more motivated if we're optimistic or demotivated if we're pessimistic. It makes us more confident if we're optimistic or we lose confidence if we're pessimistic and we're totally stressed if we're pessimistic, but we're not that stressed if we're optimistic. Now going back to Thomas Edison as an example, as history is written, he actually took all this charcoal and he applied it all this different bamboo and the first time he did it, failure. So he said, I don't have to do that way anymore. He tried another way, didn't work. Tried another way, didn't work. And as history is written, he says it took him about 10,000 times to find the right bamboo with the right charcoal and combine that to have the right longer lasting filament. And so the idea is that Thomas Edison is this hugely optimistic person because of his attributional style, but really how he explained failure. And he explained it by, if I change my strategy, success is around the corner. Now I'm going to go into a lot more detail about uh, um, optimism and optimism theory and the science behind that, but because the talk is also about creating a culture that's optimistic, I also want to share with you an overall framework about how we create cultures. So with that being said, uh, and, and actually, before we move on, let me tell you, this talk is not about me. This talk's about you. Feel free to ask any questions. You're not going to interrupt. I learned so much from your questions. Uh, actually, last summer, I was speaking to eight-year-old golfers in Franklin, the golf house, about mental toughness. And if you've spoken to eight-year-olds, you know they do this for 20 minutes. And I said, you guys have any questions, any questions? And finally, this guy starts jumping up and he's, he, and, and I go, what is he? He goes, uh, uh, you know, you look just like Will Ferrell. <laughs> so it must be my hair, I don't know. I was hoping for George Clooney, but you can't pick your parents. So let me explain to you the overall framework of what I believe what creates a culture. So it's really a trickle down effect from the leader, the leader, who is the CEO, the manager, the supervisor, the parent, the coach, has a vision. Now he or she then communicates that vision. And I have communication in bold letters because we're really gonna focus on that as you'll see later in the talk. And that's really how one of the best ways, not the only way, but one of the best ways to communicate your vision. And then if your communication is succinct and powerful, you create a culture. And if the culture is understood by everybody, then there's a best fit. You know you fit within that or you don't. And if you fit, you have satisfaction and you have high performance. If you don't fit, you, you might leave. So let me give you some what I think are some uh, effective examples. So let's talk about this guy right here, Steve Jobs. So who has an iPhone in here? Raise your hand. Thanks, Steve Jobs. Who has an Android? So those are ripoffs of iPhones. So thank Steve Jobs. <laughs> So Steve has this, his vision was make a dent in the universe. And let me just say, I get this from a book. Um, it's, it's, 
I like to take all my stuff from autobiographies. And this was this guy named Walter Jacobson. He wrote a book, Steve Jobs, and he interviewed Steve 40 times. So I'm going to consider it an autobiography. But his vision for Apple was make a dent in the universe. So what does that mean? Is it uh, Chad? What does that mean to you? Make a dent in the universe. Change the world, exactly. Make a dent in the universe. Make a huge impact in the world. Change the world. So, so Steve didn't want Apple to be a computer company. He didn't want it to be a phone company. He just didn't want it to be a music company. And they were moving on to TV. He wanted all that. He wanted to make a dent in the universe. And to make a dent in the universe, you needed A-plus players. And Perfection was the standard, and he says that. Perfection is the standard. Excellence is not the standard. If we're going to change the world, perfection is the standard. So if you know about Steve, was he known as a nice guy or a jerk? He was known as a jerk, but that's not true. Because he was a jerk to the C players and the D players and the people he didn't think fit within his company. But the A players, he was really supportive. So let me give you a true story. This guy's sitting in the... Um, interview room. He's really, he's almost crying. He's real sad. Steve sees that. He walks in. He goes, What's, what are you so upset about? He goes, I really want to work for your company. I blew this interview. They're not going to hire me. And Steve says, show me what you got. And he opens up his computer and he's the guy that invented the magnifying glass. And Steve said, you're hired. You're an A player. And he was that way to his best players because he knew if you want a company that's going to change the world, perfection is the standard and that's his culture. And if you fit, you were happy if you didn't fit, you thought Steve was a jerk, and you probably left. So here's another example of a company and their culture. Does anybody have Patagonia, yeah. the outdoor wear? Real successful company. So the background story is Jacques Girard is a mountain climber. He's still alive. And he started with equipment for mountain climbing. And then he realized clothing was much more uh, lucrative. So he created a clothing company. And he's very much an advocate for the environment. And his vision for his company is we are stewards of the environment. And none of their clothing, none of their dyes hurt the environment. He also created a 1% charity. So all the profits from the company go to this 1% charity. And this 1% charity helps the environment. And he, and he tries to get other companies to contribute to the 1% charity. Now, people that work there are these environmental types, right? And he actually, I get this from his autobiography. It's called Let My People Surf. Because the company is next to the beach. And he says, you can go surfing anytime you want. Just come back and do your job. Now, that's a cool boss, right? So. The people that fit are real happy. They're satisfied. He's got great retention. And again, he's got a culture that's totally different than Steve Jobs, but it works, right? So let me give you a third one. So Condoleezza Rice, what's she known for? This is your civics lesson. She's the first African-American woman who's Secretary of State. So the background story is, and this is tragic, she grows up in Birmingham. Her father wants to get a graduate degree, and you can't, at that time, get a graduate degree if you're African American in Alabama. So they basically have to go to Denver all the time so he can get a, a uh, her father can get an advanced degree. Well, the this cool little story is, she's an only child, but they would vote who would be the president of the trip every time, and she became president of the trip. And that's why she became a leader, but that's a different story. But she also went to the University of Denver to um, get her degree. She got a PhD in Russian studies. That's crazy, isn't it? Who's going to get a PhD in Russian studies? But she gets a job at Stanford. She's in a room like this, and the National Security Advisor comes in, and they're talking about Russian and what they're going to do with Russia and everything. And she stands up, and she goes, I don't believe that's right. I don't think you're following the right path. And he like, he's taken aback, but he, he's so impressed with her, he says, I want to see you afterwards. And when they talk, he's so impressed with her, he hires her right there to become his assistant, the secretary, national security advisor assistant. And then she becomes the national security advisor, and then she becomes secretary of state. And her model is stand up, be heard. And that's kind of her culture that she wants people to stand up and be heard. So again, they're all different, and they all work. But I, what I really like about Condoleezza Rice, number one, she plays a lot of golf. So I always like that. Number two, she went back, and now she's a professor at Stanford. So I thought that was really cool. Um, so 
Let me tell you a little bit about Thomas Edison and what the culture he created. I know you've heard this quote. Success is 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. I know everybody's heard that quote, but what does that quote mean? You gotta work hard, talent's not enough. Talent's only a little bit, you have to work hard. So the way he communicated with his people was it's okay to fail. You're gonna fail, but you better work hard. You're gonna fail, you better work hard and failure's okay, because eventually we're gonna be successful. And we're gonna invent all this great stuff. So before I move on, in case you're on Jeopardy, we need to figure out and discuss what's the great stuff that Thomas Edison invented besides the longer lasting light bulb. So what else did he invent? Phonograph, phonograph which is called the graphophone, right? What else? That's the pre-CD player, if you're wondering. Okay, what else? He invented the... He invented direct current, which lost to AC, but that's a different story. He invented the ticker tape for Wall Street, and he invented probably what you've done in the last month, movies. The way we see movies, he invented movies. So you can, this guy is, he had more impact on our lives than anybody. And it's because he created an optimistic culture with his staff, and they just invented all this great stuff. So with that being said, Let's talk a little bit more about the theory of optimism, because I think if you understand the framework of optimism and then how you apply it into the culture, you're gonna be more effective and successful. So I have this whiteboard, even though it's on here, I'm going to kind of share with you the framework. And then, let me tell you this, we are going to see if you're optimist or a pessimist. Who thinks they're an optimist? Raise your hand. Who thinks they're a pessimist? And who is that river in Egypt, uh, denial? Okay, just making sure. I'm gonna wager half of you are pessimists in this room, but you'll see where I'm going with that. Okay, so here's the theory, it's real simple. When you fail and you're an optimist, you're gonna wanna know why. Everybody who fails, whether you're a pessimist or optimist, they wanna know why, okay? And they're gonna explain their failure a certain way, that's attributions. Now what optimists do is they blame it on something which I created an acronym called TUF, Temporary, Unique, and Flexible. But let me just go back a step and say, this theory is based on Martin Seligman's work. Martin Seligman is the most famous, well-known psychologist in the world, okay? And I just made his stuff more user-friendly because he's an academic and he doesn't speak uh, normal, he speaks academic ease, and you're like, what did he just say? So I'm trying to make it user friendly, but he wrote a book called Learned Optimism. So if you like this stuff, um, you can get a lot of the stuff in that book. So, so let me explain how this works. So at Florida State, Florida State, that's where I went to school for my master's, so I'm gonna tell you, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to tell you that in a minute. But at Austin P, you have to get a, uh, you have to pass a math class at Austin P. If you don't pass a math class, you don't graduate. So an optimist, let's say they're taking the math class and they fail the first test, they might say temporary, something temporary, like uh, I just didn't have it for that test. You know, I just didn't have the right energy, or I just messed up. But it's only temporary, unique. That chapter I didn't get but I'm gonna get all the other chapters. So that's specific for that event. F stands for flexible, which, which means within their control. Um, if I change my tutor, if I get a tutor, or I change the way I study, ultimately, I'm gonna be successful. So success is around the corner when you have those attributions. And when you have those attributions and you believe success is around the corner, that means your motivation stays the same or gets better, your confidence stays the same or gets better, and your anxiety or stress goes down because you know you're gonna pass, okay? Let's do, let's do a different one. You're a pessimist, and then we'll relate it to your world in a minute. You're a pessimist and you fail, you're gonna wanna know why, and you blame it on something that is called PAGUK. I just couldn't find a great acronym, so we're gonna call it PAGUK, okay? And this stands for Permanent Global 
uncontrollable. So they failed the math test, permanent. I, I'm not good at math. I'm never going to be a good math. I'm never going to pass this test. Global. It's not this chapter. It's every chapter. And uncontrollable. It doesn't matter if I get a tutor or if I change my attitude or my work. I'm never going to pass. So failure is continual. And because failure is continual, that means motivation goes down. They might drop out. Confidence, they don't think they could pass, that goes down, and their stress level goes up. Now, the reason why this is so powerful is, remember what Edison said? Perspiration is what, 90%? Talent is 10%? It has nothing to do with talent. This is really mindset. I know everybody heard about mindset. This is the optimistic mindset, and this is the pessimistic mindset. This person, Let's say she is going to Austin P and she wants to be a doctor and she fails the first class, she keeps on trying, she passes the, the class, she becomes a doctor. This person wants to be a doctor, they have a pessimistic mindset and they drop out and this person becomes head fry cook at McDonald's. It has nothing to do with talent, it all has to do with their mindset, right? So think about, let's, let's pick an example with you. Who has to present in front of a group? usually, a couple of you. And presenting is very important. It gives you influence, it gives you persuasion, and maybe you are working with someone that needs to present, like you're coaching them, and they don't want to present to the group, and they're real nervous. Well, what can you say? Well, if they fail, you could say, you know, sometimes you give a good speech, sometimes you don't. Maybe that content didn't click with them, right? Or Flexible. Maybe you need to watch some TED Talks and see how they, you know, people engage on good TED Talks. But ultimately, by telling them that, by coaching them, by using the right words at the right time, you can flip their mindset so that they believe sex is, success is around the corner. So that motivation, they're still motivated to um, be prepared. They're still confident they can do a good job and their stress level goes down. So, so see how that works. Does anybody have any questions? I'm doing this kind of fast, of course, because I just want to share with you the overall framework. But I think if you know the overall framework, then you can apply it, which we're going to do in a minute. But I know this isn't Christmas, but I want to give you something um, that everybody is going to, I hope, feel like. Whoops. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So let me just tell you what this is. I got it. So I created this online course called Emotional Toughness University. And it has six sections. It has a confidence section, anxiety section, or de-anxiety concentration. It has videos, articles, and applied exercises. But what I want to do is I'm going to give you the code so that you can, get on, you can do the course for free. So it's TNHR19. And I, I don't, you don't have to capitalize it. And let me just share with you how, how you get in, because it's a little bit tricky. You go to course access, and I'll tell you why we're doing this in a minute. You go to course access, and then you just go down to mental toughness training 399, click onto that. And then what you do is it says, do you have a discount code? You click onto that, and you put in TNHR19, and boom, it should say zero. So now you're in. All you got to do is put in a username and your password. You could fake your email. No one's going to collect your email. Your address, fake your address. We don't care about that, but even though it's on the code. So, so you can go back because it's going to be for, for until uh, 2019. The reason why I want to do this is there's a bunch of videos in the emotional, it's in the confidence section, emotional preparedness section, that has stuff about this and articles. So if you want to know more about it, there's just more information on that. What's the website? What's the oh, I'm sorry. Emotional Toughness University. Dot com or dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Emo oh, sorry. Thanks for telling me. Emotional Toughness University dot com. And there's articles on anxiety control, concentration. It was, I'll tell you what happened. I created a MOOC for Austin P. You guys know what a MOOC is? 
massive online open course. You know, it's free. Like 10,000 people from around the world took this. And then I just flipped it into this website. So let me just try to get this back to that. Oh, I know what I do. Any questions about that? Who thinks I look like Will Ferrell? Just making sure. OK. George Clooney? OK. So what I want to do next, actually, before I assess you, which you'll like, uh, I want to tell you a little about the research and share with you how important it is to get people to be optimistic. So the reason why I'm so excited about this topic is because in 19 88, I did my master's thesis with swimmers. So yes, I could play on the senior golf tour if I was good enough. OK. Um, so I, I, I went to Florida State for my master's. You want to do that again now? Yoo-hoo. OK. And, um, and we, we basically assessed the swim team. A lot of these swimmers are going to the Olympics. Like It was a top level swim team. And we basically said, what would your best time be in 75 meter freestyle? Now, none of them swim 75 meter freestyle, so they didn't know. And whatever they said, let's say they said 40 seconds, the coach was in on it, he had a stopwatch, and he said 42 seconds. We added two seconds. Total failure for these swimmers. So we, yes, we lied to them, fake news. We then had them swim again, and here's the cool stuff. The optimistic swimmers swam faster the second time, the pessimistic swimmers swam slower. So why would the optimistic swimmers swim faster? They're trying to beat their own time. Well, they're doing something else. They're say, what are they saying to themselves? What's the m mindset they have? Well, they're, they're going beyond that. They're saying, if I change, oh, I just didn't do well, so maybe I got to stretch a little, or I got to put my hand a little different. They're changing probably their strategy. I made a mistake by I didn't ask them what they're thinking, but you know, I'm not a great researcher. But that's most likely what they're thinking. What are the pessimistic swimmers thinking? Yeah, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm still going to fail. And the cool part about it is it's not the best swimmers on the team are optimistic and the worst swimmers are pessimistic. There was an equal distribution. So that was, that's the amazing thing. All right, let me tell you another one. So who took the SAT to get into college in here or the ACT? OK, so it's a regional thing. It's all the same. Why do you take the ACT or the SAT? Because they, they want your money. That's what people believe. That's not the case, but yes, that's what you believe. <laughs> it has predictive validity. If you score like in the top you know, 99 percentile, the best, they say you're going to be the best in college. It means they're predicting how well you do in college, and you get a scholarship. Well, the test I'm about to give you, the attributional style questionnaire, which measures your optimism or pessimism, actually assesses or predicts your success in college better than the SAT or ACT. Now, Martin Seligman teaches at the University of Pennsylvania, which is one of the best schools in the country. And because he's so powerful, every freshman at that college has to get, take the test I'm about to give you. And if you basically go in the pessimistic level, you have to take a remedial class. So think about this as your remedial class. Okay. No, you basically have to, they, when you're in that class, they help you to become more optimistic. So that's, that's how powerful they believe the, um, the system is. And then life insurance agents. So don't worry that it's life insurance. Just think salespeople. Salespeople have a lot of rejection, a lot of failure. Well, the optimistic salespeople sold twice as much product and stayed in their job twice as long than the pessimistic people. And now MetLife uses the ASQ to assess whether you're going to get that job or even get the interview. Um, and so they think it's that important. And the most important one, I think, has to do with Hall of Fame baseball players. Now, you only know this answer if you collected baseball cards. And the question I have to ask you is, when was the Hall of Fame, when was the first year of the Hall of Fame baseball? See, no one knows that. 1935. You know why I tell you that? Because there's a lot of dead Hall of Fame baseball players. And here's what they did. They assessed quotes from optimistic and pessimistic Hall of Famers. So what would a quote be from a pessimistic Hall of Fame baseball player when they just had a terrible game? I lost it. 
I'm in a terrible slump. What would be an optimistic quote? We'll get him next time. Now listen to this. They divided or they thought, you know, from their, from their quotes, they got the optimistic baseball players and the pessimistic baseball players. Now they're all dead, but they discovered the optimistic baseball players live longer than the pessimistic baseball players. Yeah, you have less stress in your life. Whatever it might be, but how cool is that? So I know it's really important to become more optimistic, but I also know what you are really interested in is thinking, because I know you're in HR, am I really optimistic or am I pessimistic? So we're gonna do that next. What are you? So I have a question. Yep. A lot of people that say, oh, I'm optimistic, but I'm just realistic. Is that code for That's saying, pessimistic. I'm really a pessimist? Yeah, <laughs> pessimists are realistic, okay. yeah. Okay, can I just get this real quick? Okay, so get this, so we're, this is the ASQ. This is actually Martin Seligman's assessment he gave me. So this is validated, it's done in, a, you know, it's been done like with a thousand research articles. Um, and let me explain, this front page, it just explains the scoring code. And I just wanted to share with you what it is, but we're not gonna use that. I mean, we're gonna do the code, but I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to do the, the actual questionnaire. Okay, so the way it works, is so see where this is one this is question one this is question two and then they're all numbered three four five six they go to eight so the first question says you meet a friend who compliments you on your appearance so you have to now give a reason so like i'm wearing my skinny jeans uh, i just got a haircut you have to write down a reason so everybody has to write down one reason why your friend just complimented you but you, you don't, don't think about it. You've got to write it down because you'll see how this works. So you could use skinny jeans if you want. You could use haircut. Just write down one reason. Okay, you got that? Now, now look at, look at over here. Like I would say the sub number over here on the left is two. Look what this question says. It says, is the cause of your friend's compliment due to something about you or something about other people or circumstances? So based on that reason, is it totally due to other people or circumstances or totally due to me? So you could circle one or seven, but it's a sliding scale. So it could be three, it could be five. So pick a number and circle it. So is it totally due to you, other people, but you have to circle that number. Okay, and the next one says, in the future, when you're with your friend, will this cause again be present? Will never again be present? Will always be present. So again, circle a number, sliding scale. One to seven, could be a three, could be a five. And the third one says, is the cause something that affects interacting with friends, or does it also influence all areas of your life? So again, if it's just this one particular situation, it's one, all areas seven. Because you wear your skinny jeans everywhere you go. Okay, so I'll do one more with you. It says, you've been looking for a job unsuccessfully for some time. Now I know everybody has a job, but let's say you're looking for a new job or when you were looking for a job unsuccessfully, you know, kind of a failure. What's, what's a cause? Go ahead and write it down. What could be a cause for you not to get that job you want? Okay, and then you're gonna circle those numbers, again, related to that cause. Now there's eight of them, so I'm gonna just let you do this for five minutes, and then I'm gonna share with you how to score it. So do all eight, and then we'll, we'll talk about it in about five minutes. So just take five minutes to do it. Raise your hand if you're done. Oh, okay, good. All right, let's stop for one minute, because I know some of, most of you are done, but some of you are still working on it. 
and I'll get your number in a minute. But I want to explain to you how to score it, okay? So this is how you score it. So this was on the front page, but I'm going to keep it real simple. So this is the scoring key, but I'm going to keep it real simple. So you take, so this is question one, right? So question one is right here. Whatever numbers you circled, so let's say you circled 777, seven, seven, that's 21. You add those up. Questions three, whatever numbers you circled, the three questions, you add that up. Question seven, whatever numbers you circled, you add that up. Questions eight, whatever numbers you circled, you add that up. Okay? And then you get a total, right? Okay? And then you do the same thing with questions two, four, five, and six. Three questions, three questions, three questions, three questions. Now, these were the positive questions, and these were the negative, like you failed, you didn't do well, whatever. As you can see, there were some positive, some negative. And you basically get a number here. So you take this number minus this number, and that's your attributional style. So I'm going to ask you for this number in a minute, OK? So before we start again, is there any questions about that? Because I know some people have uh, never done this. So is it, is it clear for everybody? OK, good. Yep, you add those together for questions one. See the numbers are over here on the side? OK, so if you're still working on your score, that's fine. I'll get them. But if uh, just I'll start collecting them. Do, number one. one. You're number one. 18. 18. OK. How about over here? You could just throw out some numbers. Negative 24. Negative 24. OK. Seven. Seven. 12. 12. 41. 41. <laughs> don't, be, don't be shy. You're OK. Anybody else? 37, OK. Negative two. Negative 2, OK. 2, OK. 16, 16. OK. 14, 7, OK. 14, 7. 42, OK. 27, OK. 24. All right. 17. 17. No, that's a oh, that's a 7? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 17, OK. Negative 1, OK. What else? Anybody else? 38. Anybody else? OK, so if you're still working, that's fine. So I'm going to, I'm going to, this is how research works. It's called a median split. And if you had more numbers, it would go right here. So everybody with seven or below is considered a pessimist. <laughs> As it relates to your peers, everybody of 12 and higher is an optimist. So raise your hand if you're an optimist. Raise your hand if you think you're an optimist. Keep it up. OK. Raise your hand if you're a pessim if you're in, you got this score. Keep it up if you think you're a pessimist. So pretty close. OK. Um, remember I said half will you be an optimist, half will you be a pessimist. That's because you do a median split in research. We don't have time for this, but let me tell you what I do in my sports psych class. But I've been doing it for 20 years. I say to them, we do the median split, and I say also, you just failed the sports psych midterm. Just pretend you did. How hard would you work to pass or get a good grade on the final? One, not hard at all. Seven, you're going to work your butt off. For 20 years, this is always like five out of seven, and this is like four out of seven. Like clearly, they're always working harder than, than they are. So it has a lot of predictive validity. It's very powerful. Uh, and you could do it for anything. You could talk about stress level. You'd find the same thing. The reason why I wanted to give you this assessment, this is the real assessment, even though I made it about, it's about half of the real one, because I know a lot of you might want to use it. And you could just ask Martin Seligman to get it. So any questions about that? Okay. 
the research is important, but what's even way more important is how do we create an optimistic culture at home and at work? And that's what I want to talk about next. And that is really through communication. And it's called the ABCD, ABCDs. So A stands for adversity. I just bombed a speech for, with my peers, you know, training, whatever it is. Beliefs, I'm not very good at speaking in front of others. Consequences, I never want to do another speech in front of my peers. And of course, that's going to hurt you. That's going to hurt the business, whatever it is. And then D is dispute. You, and we're going to do this in a minute, but you're going to have to coach this person using the tough strategy so that they believe, they become more optimistic, they're motivated, they're, they're more confident that they can give a good speech. So as an example, that's what I had, ABC. But D could be as a dispute. Well, maybe you were nervous, but you can control your nervousness. Another example could be temporary. Sometimes we just give bad speeches. And then um, another one is unique. Maybe we already did this one. Your, your content didn't click with that group. Try different content. Again, words are very powerful. If you use the right words at the right time, you have immense power. This tough technique is very subtle, but very powerful. So what I want to do next is take three real examples from your life and then have you coach someone, do it. So with that being said, in your world, because I didn't want to just create them for you, what are three failures that could happen in the HR world in the sense of it doesn't have to be a complete bomb. It could be this person didn't live up to the expectations or you didn't live up to your expectations. So what's, give me an example of a failure in your world, in the HR world. Didn't meet a deadline. For okay, missed a deadline, okay. Okay, what's another one? Underperforming employee. Underperforming employee, okay, good one. And what's the third one? We'll just do three. Not getting paid correctly? Well, that, I'm not, I'm, that could be fixed. That's not their fault. Even though that's important, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to use a different example. Okay, the wrong person. Well, you can't fix that person because they're hired. So I'm going to change that. Yeah, uh, upset. I'll just say upset employee because you can't really coach some of this. You can't coach them to be a different person, per se. Upset employee. Okay, now what you're going to do is everybody needs to get a partner. So everybody get a partner next to you. Say hi. Share your name. Maybe, uh, or you, and we could have three if we have to. So everybody get a partner. If you don't have a partner, raise your hand, and maybe we'll just do three. Okay, okay you could be three. That's fine. You could be three. Three, everybody has partners? Okay, this is what I want you to do. Based on these three events, you're gonna come up with, okay, so let me give you the, it's like a role play, the scenario. You are coaching this employee or the staff member. You are coaching them to be more optimistic using the tough strategy. So you're gonna say this to them so that they become more motivated, persistent, have greater persistence, less stress. So what are you gonna say to them using TUF, temporary explanation, unique explanation, flexible explanation. And do all three, okay? And, we'll, and then we'll, we'll meet up in 10 minutes, five minutes. Okay, you ready? One more minute. I got to get you out of here pretty soon, though.
Okay, you ready? All right, so we got it. Let's just move forward. We'll just discuss some. So, miss a deadline. So, what could you say? You could just throw it out, or we could uh, share. How about I'm going to ask? Tam, is it Tam? Can't my con? Oh, Natalie. Well, <laughs> I almost said Tamalin. What would you say temporary? That would be temporary to that person. They missed a deadline. Um, we were in a shorter cycle this time. Yeah. Um, that would be, you know, some of these overlap. That would be unique. This is a specific shorter cycle. So that's good for that one. What would be t more related to temporary? Just a fluke. You missed a deadline. That never happens with you. It's, it's don't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like it's an outlier. That's the, and you think about it, if they believe it's an outlier, they believe the cycle will change, that's going to make them feel good. Right, or make her feel good. And what could you say that's flexible? With, so it gives them, that means giving them control over the situation. Yeah, let's have more of a time management plan. Boom, right? And now they're more prepared and therefore they're confident. Okay, this, one's, this one could be tough, but I'm sure it happens all the time. Underperforming employee. What do you say temporarily? That relates to temporary. Illness? Yeah, maybe um, they had an illness, something's affecting. Their, that's perfect because that changes. What about unique? Their job duties change and they weren't trained for those job duties? Maybe their job, yeah, maybe your duties aren't, you're not trained correctly. Maybe we got to retrain you. Perfect. And some of these relate, they're overlap, but. But you're, you're right, because specifically, you weren't trained specifically for this job. If we train you for the specific job, you're going to be successful. And that, and, that, what, and that relates a little bit to F. Could be what? Then you'd be moved into another well, let's talk, not talk about training. We could talk about, and I, I do this all the time, but you have control over your attitude, right? I believe you're going to perform if you, think about how easy it is to change your attitude. That's the easiest thing in the world, really, because you have control over that. That will make them change. And now they believe they're successful. So some of these overlap, I know. But the idea is that the words that you say are so powerful, and if they believe it relates to something temporary, unique, and flexible, success is around the corner. All right, let's do one more. You've got a disgruntled employee, because I know you've had one. Yeah. <laughs> just, just yesterday. So that would be flexible. Right. What do you say temporary to them? Maybe relate to that. Yeah, you usually don't act like this. This is a this is a one time off for you. Okay. What about unique? And th that's similar. They're similar. Yeah, or, you know. Maybe there's something unique happened outside work that's affecting you sure. this week. And you know, it doesn't really matter even if it's a lot of the stuff you say might not be true, but it makes them, well, it might not be that you know it, but it's probably true. Right. And it probably relates to something that you're saying. And ultimately, you could ask them, hey, is there something going on outside work? I know you did that, but we'll see that's unique. Right. But you got you to gotta focus on the uniqueness. No, only as it relates to the group. Yeah, being responsible. Right. So I guess the question for you is how do you balance like your your coach and you're building in them into them, you're you know, building them up. How do you point out some of the things that they truly need to improve upon? Right. And that that's a real good question. But let me first say, you know what the most um, pessimistic occupation is? Being a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> being a lawyer. Okay. Um, so don't feel bad. Okay. So so Yes, they have to take responsibility. But if you think about it, sometimes their negative mindset, their pessimistic mindset, is a habit. 
it's become a bad habit and it's blocking their talent. And if you change that habit and flip the switch, then their talent comes out. That's the best way to say it. It's not that they're not taking responsibility. It's that their bad habit is pushing their talent down. You want them, their talent to rise. Yeah. So thanks for that question. Let me finish with talking about culture, a little bit more about culture. Culture is very important. But it becomes very, very important when the squeeze is on, when the economy takes a dive, or when there's a bunch of obstacles. That's when your true culture comes out. So let me explain it with this orange. And I do this in my class. So first question, if I squeeze this orange, what comes out? Juice. Could be pineapple juice. Orange, orange juice. Orange juice always comes out. If I squeeze it yesterday, orange juice comes out. If I squeeze it tomorrow, orange juice always comes out. Question two, why does orange juice come out? You're close. Because that is what is inside. Question three, what have you put inside your department or your company? If you put in negativity and doubt, that's what comes out when you get squeezed, because we all get squeezed, that's the human condition. But if you put in confidence and optimism, that's what comes out when you get squeezed. And so it was my goal today to show you how to put in optimistic juice so that you can create an optimistic culture at work and at home so that you can get the motivation and the confidence and the less stress in all areas of your life. So it's definitely been my honor and my privilege to share that with you today. So have a great day and thank you very much.